Chairman. You're listening to What Do You Know on News Talk KGVO, AM 1290 and 98.3 FM. Arnie Sherman, good morning to you. Good morning, Scott. We're heading into the end of summer where students may or may not be going back to school. You know, we don't know. We don't know when uh, there might be an end in sight to all of this upheaval and turmoil. And uh, Democratic and Republican conventions are coming up and a national election of significant consequences coming up, but it's hard to focus on anything else other than this continued COVID pandemic um, situation that, that doesn't go away. Right. And actually doesn't change very much, at least here in the United States. You know, today on the show, I thought it would be a, a good uh, uh, sort of topic to look at is since we weren't able to get away this summer. What is the state of uh, transportation right now in the U.S.? Both air and, uh, you know, other means of uh, travel, train, subway, um, cruise ship lines, and just driving. And um, I thought it might be a good guest to bring on board is uh, is my friend and, uh, you know, your colleague as well, uh, Peter Goltz, who uh, ran National Transportation Safety Board for a number of years as the managing director and uh, since he's been in that position continues to consult and work with a number of transportation uh, organizations and companies including one of the major flight attendants association and has commented uh, uh, continually on cnn and other uh, news sources right on uh, on transportation issues both calamities when there are uh, you know kobe uh, the Kobe Bryant uh, helicopter crash. He was on uh, um, every day talking about that. Uh, the situations like the one we're uh, we're facing now with 170,000 plus dead, and every single day it seems in Montana there's another hundred plus cases, and you know, and um, people dying. And Missoula, you know, it doesn't go a day by without you know report of uh, people being infected, no matter what we do. It's kind of amazing that we're not even done with the summer yet, and we're at 170,000 plus deaths at the time of this. What's shocking about it is that, you know, at one point, the president and, you know, the White House said uh, there'd hardly be anybody dead. And then the the regroup on that has been uh, just this past week where they're saying, well, 170,000 dead isn't so bad. You know, it's just shocking. Shocking to me, you know, particularly, uh, you know, after uh, last week's show, we when we heard from Cindy Farr and uh, uh, about, uh, you know, the local situation here. And we heard from uh, Tino Sonora about the economic impact of all of this. It's uh, it's amazing that we uh, no matter how we slice this horrible situation, it just doesn't get better. It doesn't get better. And we. Right. And we can't let ourselves be desensitized to the reality of what we're dealing with. One death is one too many. Right. And, uh, you know, it's not the flu. I think uh, most uh, informed and educated people uh, uh, agree on that. It's a it's a different uh, animal that we're dealing with and it's hard to deal. It's hard to deal with. And we don't have a a vaccine and we're probably not going to have one until early uh, uh, 2021. And and we don't have a national policy and we leave it up to states and and uh, states handle it differently. I think we've had a pretty good and responsible response from Montana and uh, we're keeping it under as much control as we can given the economic and political realities of the times we live in. Other states who have not exercised as much prudent, you know, uh, the kind of caution that we've exercised um, are seeing, uh, you know, tremendous numbers of sick and dead. Florida just passed 10,000. Uh, Georgia has epidemics uh, going on in hot spots all over the state where they just have not 
taken this in any public policy fashion as seriously as it ought to be taken. It's kind of astounding. Arnie, when we come back, we will be with our guest, the managing director, former managing director of the NTSB and CNN commentator, Peter Goltz. Back after this. Hunter Bay. Herman, good morning to you. Who's our guest this morning? Good morning, Scott. We're lucky to have all the way from Washington, D.C. via Zoom, Peter Goltz, a good friend of mine who uh, for many years was the uh, executive director of uh, National Transportation Safety Board, and ever since then has been an, a lively commentator um, on transportation issues and transportation calamities for uh, CNN and other media sources. And so I thought as we are six, seven months into this pandemic and people are still nervous about what's the state of uh, airlines and trains and buses and all sorts of uh, mass transport, I thought we'd bring Peter on the show and uh, try to find out what's going on. Good morning, Peter. Hey, so good we, morning, Arnie. Good morning, Scott. Good, good to talk to you. Good. So you are the guru of all things transportation, as I see it. Well, that's so, a that's a stretch, but that's fine. <laughs> well, my first question is: I'm getting a lot of smoke out of my muffler, and I was wondering. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you focus on that. That that's car talk. Right. <laughs> but but for our listeners, what? What does NTSB do? And what was what jurisdiction did you have when you were running that organization? Uh, well, the NTSB, uh, I was the managing director there, and the, the NTSB is kind of a unique animal in Washington, D.C. It's, it's an independent agency, which means that it does not report to the executive branch, and uh, it only reports to the Congress. And the Congress insists that it be independent uh, so that its investigations are not politically, uh, uh, you know, tainted or anything like that. And um, uh, we cover accidents on rail, on aviation, on marine, on pipeline, uh, and in automobiles. So all five modes of transportation are, are covered uh, by our jurisdiction. But we have a small, the agency has a small staff, probably no more than 450. And uh, we, we, we target our resources to investigations of accidents that are either very high profile that the public is concerned about, or to those accidents where we think there's a broader safety issue at play. And, uh, and so what is what is NTSB's mandate in the COVID era? Do they have any responsibility in terms of COVID safety? No, they are not involved in, in COVID safety. Uh, you know, and that's that, that's really one of the, I think, one of, one, one of the disturbing aspects of, uh, of this whole COVID crisis is that uh, the Department of Transportation uh, and the FAA have really a broader jurisdiction over over travel safety, uh, everyday travel safety. And they really have taken a pass on this, uh, that there has been no national policy for safe travel in, uh, in, in aircraft or in trains or in buses. Uh, it's really... Uh, I think a, a significant problem and has shown a profound lack of leadership uh, by the Secretary of Transportation uh, and by the leadership of the FAA. You know, you know, the FAA has a medical department uh, in Oklahoma City uh, that, that that is really the uh, they are experts in cabin air quality, yet they have not issued a, a single uh, statement. Uh, on whether it's uh, whether the COVID, uh, uh, you know, the, um, the, the the germs, how they spread within the within the cabin, uh, they, they've really been silent, and it's been disappointing. So I haven't flown since February seventeenth. So it's more than 
six months, and that's the longest probably in my adult life. Um, I probably I probably was traveling up to then once, sometimes twice a month. Scott, when was the last time you traveled? Gosh, Arnie, I think it was the end of February, beginning of March. Right, and Peter, when was the last time you were on a plane? I flew. Uh, I flew in the end of February and came down with the flu. I thought I'd I thought I'd gotten the uh, the COVID, but it ended up being just type A flu. But so I was, it was towards the end of February. All of us who are active flyers have have been off the airlines for the last six months. Airlines want us to believe it's safe. They talk about you know filtration systems and masks. But I think uh, air travel is down 85% from this time last year globally, and I think down 72% in the U.S. from last year. So the real pointed question is, given the lack of the FAA involvement and Department of Transportation involvement in all of this, how safe is it to fly? Well, I think, I, unfortunately, I, I, still, I think that's partially still an open question. I mean, there 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 have been a number of uh, of uh, theoretical uh, you know analysis of, of of the cabin in which it says well because the air circulates two times a minute because they have a certain level of of HEPA filters on the planes uh, virtually all of the planes except uh, the seven eight sevens use a a system of uh, of air uh, circulation called bleed air, which is driven by the engines. They, and they have HEPA filter systems, but it's not clear whether the HEPA filters are uh, advanced enough to pick up the smallest uh, micron. You know, I think it's, they, they only pick up uh, three microns and larger uh, of, 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 the, uh, of the virus. It, it's, it's just not clear. Uh, how safe it is. I can tell you from my flight attendants, uh, they are all, uh, and I work for uh, a large flight attendant union, uh, they fly, they wear masks, uh, they've never seen the aircraft cleaner than it is now, that the cleaning crews, they, they report back universally, that the cleaning crews really do a good job and take their job seriously. Um, and there have been relatively few cases of, uh, of, of the virus among, among flight attendants. Uh, but the issue of masks and whether you may wear a mask on a, on a flight has really been a contentious issue. And that's one place where I think the, the national policy, uh, where it's lacking, has shown up particularly. So, Peter, currently you show up at, a, you show up at an airport and you don't wear a mask, you don't get on a plane. Is that correct? That is usually the case. What and happens you when you get on the get plane on. and it takes off and you take your mask off and, just, and refuse to wear it for the rest of the flight? They will, they will most likely divert the flight. Uh, they will land and they will escort you from the plane. Wow. Is, that a, are, is there a law broken if that happens? Is that a... Uh... Are, and that's, that's part of the problem, Scott. There is no law. Right. You know, uh, Secretary Chow punted on this most important issue because the president, you know, uh, was ambivalent about masks. You know, uh, she didn't want to uh, agree to a national policy where if you got on a plane, you wore the mask. Uh, if you if you didn't want to wear the mask, then you could figure out some other way to get to your destination. But but because of the president's. Uh, you know, uh, lack of a commitment to 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 uh, a mask wearing policy, she uh, she backed away from it. So each of the air carriers uh, were responsible for setting their own policies, and some were more rigorous than others. But although now I think they're they're all pretty much in line, you have to wear a mask, and if you take it off, uh, you're you're putting yourself in jeopardy of being bounced off the flight. Peter, in your in your opinion, who uh, which of the carriers has done, let's say, the best job of of getting on this early and kind of setting the setting the tone for the the other carriers? Well, I think I think that that, that there's a the usual, you know, you look at the uh, at, at at the big five or the big six, you know, of the carriers, 
you know, Alaska Airlines, you guys use them out of, out of Missoula. They are always first rate. And uh, they, they do things right. Uh, they, they care about their, uh, their flight crews and they care about their passengers. Um, I, think, uh, I think some of the other carriers, the larger carriers, were a little slow getting off the mark, but they're all there now. I mean, I know with American Airlines, if you don't wear a mask, you're, you're going to be asked to leave the plane. And with, with, with some of the other carriers I've seen where, where planes have been diverted and people asked to leave. Now, it's not a federal crime. So they just, they, I mean, there's, there, there's no punishment. But, uh, but, but there, should have been, there, there should have been a consistent policy uh, from the get-go. And uh, like a lot of other things, we, had they been done, we, 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 we might have a better handle uh, on this pandemic. Are the international carriers, the non-U.S. carriers, more rigorous about this? Many of them aren't flying yet. You know, they have only a few flights a day. Uh, you know, there is uh, uh, this, this, you know, the uh, Singapore Airlines shut down completely. Uh, you know, they're, they're just as, there is, they're overseas, they, they, they take, they've taken this much more seriously uh, than, than we have. Uh, you know, there, there probably is only a handful of flights to London these days out of the U.S. Uh, the, everyone's, everyone is waiting uh, for the levels to go down and for a vaccine and a treatment uh, regimen to, to come forward. Well, they're down a lot because in most of the countries in Europe, you have to quarantine for 14 days. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, no one's going to take a holiday and let's go quarantine in London or Paris in my hotel for 14 days. So, I mean... Yeah, it's very hard. You know, U.S. U.S. citizens are not are not welcome uh, in virtually every country in the world. You cannot fly, say, from the U.S. even to Moscow. <laughs> You'll be taken and That's put correct. on a plane being flown back. Yep, or quarantined if you were there. Well, in, in Moscow, they won't even take you for a quarantine. They'll hold you at the airport and put you on the next plane back. <laughs> Peter, do you do you see COVID impacting travel, you know, leisure travel or business travel long term, right? Like I realize people will feel a lot more comfortable when a vaccine is available and ready and adopted. But even beyond that, are people finding out that they can do with less air travel than they did before? Oh, I don't think there's any question that that business travel may never go back to the level that it was, uh, you know, prior to February of this year. I think uh, it's, it's kind of like commercial real estate. Everybody's realizing that they're working from home uh, can, can be an effective and an economic way of doing it. And I think that there's a lot of businesses that have figured out uh, that Zoom and Microsoft meetings are perfectly uh, uh, reasonable ways of, of, of doing business. Uh, so I think I think you're going to see uh, business travel uh, affected for the foreseeable future. I also think that that there's going to be certain parts of leisure travel uh, that are going to be affected for for the future. Yeah, you know, for for example, you know they 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 tried to get some of the cruise ships going again this summer, and they were disasters. You know they and uh, you know I'm not sure you'll be able to get on a cruise ship. Uh, a year from now, w w without having a health ID that says you've either had the vaccine or you've got the uh, antibody, who would get on one? So I think I, th I think there's going to be some profound changes to how we travel and, uh, and where we travel to. Are we? The, are we the? Oh, I'm sorry to interrupt, Arnie. Are we the only country? Are, are the Westernized countries the ones that travel with this great kind of? You know, prior to COVID, with that type of uh, appetite for travel, are there other countries? Oh no, no the the Asia, sub Asia, and and the Pacific is, you know, they, they that that is the massive growth area for for travel, particularly uh, low cost travel. I mean, and um, you know that was that 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 has been uh, you know some of the the fastest growing airlines 
uh, were in India, you know, Malaysia, Indonesia, uh, and, and that neck of the woods. So no, uh, you know, travel, travel from the West, if you include Europe, is always high-end travel. Okay. You know, they, they, they sell the front of the plane <clears throat> more effectively. But no, travel, travel is, was, was ubiquitous in, in, the, uh, in the Asian markets. I think one of the, the points uh, Peter mentioned about business travel, I serve on a board, Peter serves on boards. I serve on a board that required you to be in person at board meetings prior to COVID. Wow. And we've had uh, three quarterly meetings since, all done by Zoom. We've even done, you know, cocktail receptions online, you know, that we used to do in person. And I doubt. If the, the, I doubt if that organization is ever going to return to the requirement to do them in person. They're less expensive. They take every you know less time. Um, you they're just as intense. It's easy to go into executive session if you need to. I mean, there's you know there may be a once a year meeting in person for other reasons, for some training or for some other sorts of uh, you know in person kinds of things. But you know the board that I serve on. Uh, I don't think I'll ever go back. And, and I know, Peter, you're on boards. You know, yeah, what's you're, you're absolutely right. I've got a board that, that had an annual uh, meeting, uh, you know, a twice yearly meeting, one in Washington, one in Miami. Uh, we, we, we canceled the March uh, Miami meeting. We've canceled the Washington meeting. And I, I don't think, uh, I think we're going to cancel the Miami meeting in March again. Uh, and, do it, and, and do it digitally uh, instead? We, we, we meet digitally uh, on an every uh, three-week basis now, once a month. Wow. Uh, let, me, let me switch for a minute from air, yep. which, you know, is a disaster. We all know it is. The four largest airlines lost $10 billion from April through June. I think the carriers, you know, all the, all the U.S. carriers for the uh, fiscal year 2020 probably going to lose $84 billion. I want to talk about uh, subways, buses, trains for a moment. I see Amtrak is down to 50% of capacity. I saw that the New York City subway bus system is, uh, the buses are down 50%. The subway's down 75%. MARTA in Atlanta is down 12%. New York City had 4,000 subway workers that got COVID and 131 died. So, What's that going to look like in the future? Well, when think, are people going to have confidence to jam themselves on the subways and 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 uh, take off? Well, part of that, you know, that part of that ties into when is uh, when is the workplace going to go back to normal, where where uh, employers are going to expect you to show up at a at a at a fixed location, and employers are extremely nervous about requiring that. Because if they start requiring people to show up and they get sick and they die, there's a question of liability. You know, I didn't want to go. They made me go. I would have lost my job, and now I'm dead. Uh, so I think uh, I think the the idea of mass transit, uh, you know, returning to to any kind of normalcy is is at least a year or eighteen months off. And uh, and the question is is uh, are they going to have to devise uh, a new financial scheme on how to pay for it? Because I'm not sure the ridership will ever go back uh, to, to, to the pre-COVID levels, because I just don't think that, uh, that, that the workplace is going to return. Yeah, to well, New York City, as you know, we're, we're all originally from the New York greater area. I mean, there's 13,000 available apartments in Manhattan, that's the largest number in 12 years. But, you know, and, and I mentioned that subway bus is down to 2 million from about 8 million. Yeah. But there still are people, mostly service workers, that need to take public transportation. All the restaurants, all the fast food places, you know, all of the government workers that have, you know, sanitation workers. Yeah. I and mean, there's still a demand for getting to your job. And, uh, you know, I guess that's a majority of the two million that every day that are using the, the subway and buses are the ones that primarily can't uh, afford not to go go to work. Not not to go to work, and, and they're the ones that are getting sick. 
you know, this is increasingly becoming, uh, a, you know, a, 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 a disease driven by economic status. Uh, you know, the, uh, the metro systems in Washington and New York, uh, as I mentioned about aircraft, they've never been cleaner. Uh, these, these cars are, are extraordinarily uh, clean when you get on them and they, they take them out of service more and more regularly to clean them even more with, with disinfectants. Uh, but still, you know, it, it is hard to regulate the number of people in the cars. And it's it's close contact uh, with 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 other humans that, that you know when when you have someone who is getting the virus it causes the problem. So uh, I think I think mass transit is going to change uh, dramatically, particularly say on how they pay for it. I think uh, commercial real estate is going to change dramatically. Uh, and uh, air travel is, is going to change uh, dramatically, has, has changed and will stay changed. The cruise industry is, is going to have to, uh, is going to be on the ropes for a number of years. Amazing. Arnie, let's do a quick ID. Our guest is Peter Goltz. He is the former head of the NTSB and a CNN commentator. So I want to talk about the, uh, the anti-maskers you know, the health uh, care uh, and, the, and the health uh, crisis deniers. I had a, a colleague of mine say, hey, I, I, I ride the New York City subway every day for 30 years and I never got sick. So, you know, how could this be anything different from being on a jam subway every day with people from all over the world with all kinds of colds and flus? I never got sick and I'm, I don't think that this is uh, going to get me sick. Well, you know, that's a, you know, that's a, first, first of all, that's one of those, you know, anecdotal stories. We don't know that he never got sick. Correct. Right. right. So, so we'll let the, we'll, we'll let that pass. Yeah. I bet you, I bet you he's had the flu a couple of times over the past 30 years. He might've got it while he was in the subway. But, right. uh, but, but the point is, is uh, the, those, those that are de denying science and denying the, the seriousness of uh, uh, you know of, of this pandemic, really have to live with their decisions. You know that uh, you know their parents, they themselves, others are really vulnerable to this. And uh, you know there, there, there's enough stories that have been documented about people who were who said I don't believe it, and all of a sudden they're in the hospital and on a ventilator are now believers if they survive. And uh, you know you cannot deny the number of 170,000 plus people uh, that, that have died. Uh, and it's unfortunate, you know, it's, it's one of the, uh, the offshoots of the internet uh, that, that there is so much false information, so much uh, about, about health, whether it's the, the vaccine deniers, uh, you know, that uh, they, they are taking a terrible risk uh, on this. And, uh, it will come to a, to a point where there are many schools that will make a decision that if you're not vaccinated, if you are not protected, your kid is not going to school, period. Mm. Um, Peter, how do you, so, you know, it brings up a really good, interesting point because here in Missoula, we're starting to see, and as you can imagine, in some of the interior states, people are moving here. They're buying property sight unseen, they're relocating their families or they're relocating themselves. And my question, and then, you know, so I imagine some of the interior cities like Missoula or Boise or uh, Knoxville, like these places that are a little more, um, there's a little more space. How is, the, how is that going to impact both interstate, intrastate travel and uh, and interstate travel, meaning like our airport yep. getting a big spruce up, right? They're they're increasing the number of gates from what is it already like eight to, to twenty one? Yeah, um, we're gonna have the potential to have twenty gates here. Twenty gates, but like they've talked a lot, and Arnie, you probably knows a lot about this uh, as well. Like, are they gonna have an interstate rail system for passenger travel? Um, you know. Are we going to need to? Well, you know, 
Amtrak, Amtrak is down to 50% of its capacity from, uh, you know, over the last six months. And uh, I don't, again, who, who that believes that the COVID pandemic is real is going to get on a train and go for two days or three days. Right, right but what? No, no, it's not happening. And, and no one's, you know, no one's going to get on a train and want someone sitting directly next to them. <laughs> right, right. You want to so, exactly so, so each right. one of the cars are going to have to be about 40% full. And they right. were losing money when they were selling out the cars. Yep, yeah, particularly uh, on the East, East Coast. Yeah, they, they, they were looking for, for billions in subsidies before the COVID came. Yeah. So uh, they, they, have a, they have a difficult time. But Scott, you know, you're right. In, in the Northeast, uh, they, there has been a marked increase in people moving to West Virginia, to rural Maryland. Uh, a lot of the summer people who usually go to Maine in the summer started showing up in April and it caused a great deal of concern. Same thing with New Hampshire and Vermont. Uh, you know, I, I have a friend of mine who has a, uh, uh, a summer house on their property that they rent out uh, every summer and they usually start renting it about June 15th. April 1st, it was rented, and the person rented it throughout the summer until till till they have to shut it down in September. Wow! So I, I think uh, I think there those who have the money, you know, and have the resources are trying to escape. Uh, many are trying to escape the urban areas to go to areas where where, where there's less, uh, you know, less less infection and uh, less. Ch- less chance of it spreading right and just look at new york city everybody is 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 spending time out in the hamptons if they can if they can get a rental to your point starting april 1 yep don't need to set foot back into manhattan or brooklyn or queens they'll stay out there and they'll live out there i have a i have a good friend a neighbor uh who had uh both of their children uh, were were living and working in Manhattan, and they they were you know, typical. They were in, one was in Murray Hill, one on the Upper West Side. Uh, you know, they had one bedroom places. They just had uh, you know new babies, and uh, you know after the first two months, they were going crazy. They couldn't leave. They came down to Virginia just just to get away, and you know work from home down here just just to get into a uh, you know. A, 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 a twenty five hundred square foot environment as opposed to a an eleven hundred square foot environment. So Peter, you're appointed to be head of the NTSB right now with authority to make some changes to way things are being handled. What do you do? You do? What would well, what I, be some of the things that we, we should be doing that we're not doing? Well it wouldn't be the NTSB that makes those kinds of decisions. It would be the Federal Aviation Administration. Okay, so you're an FAA. And the first thing, the first yeah. thing I would have done and would do is have a single national policy on masks. That's the first thing. The second thing I would do is I would order CAMI, which is the Civil Avi Aeronautical Medical Institute, or a similar organization to do a definitive study on the transmission, the possible transmission of, of, of COVID-19 within the airframe, you know, within the cabin of an aircraft. We need to have definitive information on how or whether uh, this, uh, uh, this virus spreads. Uh, the third thing I would, I would do is that I would back up and insist that every flight attendant, every flight crew, every gate agent has absent, and this is probably pretty much true now, but it took much too long, have the kind of personal protection uh, equipment uh, that, that, uh, that is necessary. And if it means, uh, you know, that, that the flight attendants have uh, face shields, which they don't wear now, they should have them. You know, we shouldn't put yeah. these folks well, at risk. These policies- these policies all make sense, but the current policy obviously is this: if I don't know the facts, we can deny that it exists. You know, it's it's the Trump version of 
we only have this many sick people because we test so much. If we tested right. less, we wouldn't have that many sick people. Or, you know, the, the reality is we wouldn't know how many sick people we have, so we could act like we don't have a lot. Well, you know, well the thing, yeah, and, and, and the thing yeah. that, that's, that's particularly sad uh, about this situation is Secretary Chow, who's the Secretary of Transportation, she knows what the right thing to do is. The head of the FAA, they knew what the right thing to do was. But because they had this syncophanic relationship to the president, <clears throat> they didn't want a contradiction, contradict him. They didn't want to undercut, you know, his uh, skepticism of masks. They put thousands of people at risk, and it's inexcusable. They take an oath, uh, and they should have upheld it. And the oath isn't to Donald Trump. Right. And then you got the other issue, which complicates it more, which is the federal government abdicating responsibility to the states, and then the states taking, you know, um, a widely disparate views on this. You know, you know, Andrew Cuomo in New York, because of the the ravages of COVID, took a very tough stance. Other places, you know, for example, right now as we're talking, there are two hundred fifty thousand people in Sturgis. At a big motorcycle rally, I doubt if there's a mask among them. You yeah. know, and the governor of that state's just fine with that. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, you know, the 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 the, uh, the, the textbook example uh, of, or the the two textbook examples of that kind of behavior are Florida and Georgia. You know, talk 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 to the governors of Georgia and Florida and say, so how'd that work out for you and the people of of Florida and Georgia? How'd that how'd that turn out? Your, your, your initial denial of fundamental uh, safety steps. It costs thousands of lives. And Florida then, just hit 10,000 dead. Yeah, great. And, uh, you know, if you looked at his remarks uh, at the beginning of, of the crisis back in February, it's disgraceful. He should resign. Well, also, the lieutenant governor of Texas took on the position if kids go back to school, they all should go back to school. If they get sick, they can go home. Right. Yeah, nice. I mean, this is this kind of know nothing is. That's not a policy. That's not leadership. No, no, that's called know nothingism. And, uh, you know, it, it, I say it the, the disease has ravaged Florida, it ravaged Georgia, it's ravaged Texas. Any state that did not take this seriously has paid a price. Right. And one of the things, so Scott, that you might remember from our last show, we had Cindy Farr on, who's the yeah. incident commander here for, uh, you know, the COVID-19 in Missoula County. She said during this, this is not the flu. This is not just a bad flu. She said the last flu season, 2019 through 2020, about 24 to 36,000 people died from the flu. Mm -hmm. You know, in five months, we're, we've had 170,000 plus die. So this is just not a bad flu. This well, is, you know, one, one other thing I want to point out is there's no rule in the universe that says that bad things only happen one at a time. <laughs> you know, as, right. as, we enter, right. as we enter the heart of hurricane season, there's no rule to say, oh, you know, we, we've got the pandemic. Um, you know, the coast of Georgia is not going to get hit with a hurricane or there's no reason that there's, there's no rule that says that the, that the rotational flu that comes in in the fall is going to be, uh, not going to be a more virulent type. You know, there's no reason why, why we're not going to be facing a number of different national challenges. We're seeing it already in the fire season out in California. Right. You know, you bring, up a great, you bring up a great point because everyone had talked about, oh, there's going to be a, a, a second wave of the pandemic. And quite honestly, the, there was, the first wave is still running. There is no second wave. And yeah, the, this, may be, this, this may be the end of the beginning of the first wave right now. But I don't, it hasn't, the, 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 uh, <laughs> the curves have dipped down a little bit, but there is no guarantee they're going to stay down. And this is by no means, you know, the end of the of the issue. It's going to go back up, as as we've seen as colleges try to open, or open and close as Notre Dame just did. Yeah, I mean, it's you know, and and we we I just saw 
that the SEC, who are who's going to play football this fall, they claim, are going to allow the stadiums to have, hold 20% of capacity. So mm-hmm. you'll have uh, 20,000 people at those games. Fabulous. You know, how can, I, 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 and the justification for that, other than money, is what? <laughs> there's, there, you know, there's none. If it's yeah. serious enough to keep 80% away, how are you going to protect the other 20%? You think those people aren't going to be drinking beer and eating hot dogs and have their masks off and yelling <laughs> and cheering and screaming? I mean, it's, no. just, it's, it's just ludicrous. Oh, I mean, it's, bl- it's blind optimism and wishful thinking and not wanting to face the tough, the tough news. I, yeah, think, I think you got to give kudos during this time that for a sports, a sport to tackle this in at least the best way they possibly could. I think the NBA, you know, did probably the most responsible thing they could yes. do. Yep. You know, the bubble, all the players, you know, try to, you know, once you're in, you're in, you know, when they let somebody out, somebody had to be let out a couple of days ago because it was a death in their family. They had to be tested twice before they came back in. I mean, there's they're trying to you know maintain some you know no fans, no you know very few people in the facilities at all. I mean, they're trying as best as possible. It's a good example, you know, to, I mean, to show how strict you have to be, as opposed to NASCAR and what's going to happen in some of the college conferences. Yeah. Well, you know, the the idea that 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 the world is changing and has changed uh, uh, is simply uh, unacceptable uh, to certain people and uh, you know it's this this covid 19 is going to be with us uh, for at least 18 to 24 months uh, you know even if the vaccines come out on time during the first quarter of next year what they consider to be effective is about a 50% rate, 50 to 60% rate, which still means that, that there's going to be a significant portion of the public that's going to be unprotected, even if they have the vaccine, and a good portion of those are going to come down with the disease, and some will continue to die. And that's simply the facts. Right. And just like any other vaccine, they have a shelf life. I mean, yep. it's not permanent. Yep. You know, whatever research is out there now, and it's not none of it's conclusive. We don't know. Uh, it could be uh, two to three months protection. Yep. 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 They yep. Don't know how, and they don't know if you have the antibody. If you've had it, they don't know how long the antibody will last, will be effective for you. Right. You just don't know. Let's do a quick ID. Our guest is Pierre Gold. She's the former head of the NTSB and current CNN commentator. Peter, are there any federal, what federal agencies uh, that are, you know, that you've observed have done a good job and have tried to kind of break through the, the, the miasma of nonsense that comes out of the Trump administration and have like persevered and communicated clearly and given proper guidance? Well, it's very, it's very difficult to, to, to point, point to, uh, to anyone. I mean, you know, the Department of Education, uh, Ms. DeVoe has been a disaster. Uh, you know, I think, I think you do point to the CDC. Uh, those folks have done uh, as good a job as they could with the kind of pressure uh, that they've been under. Uh, they have tried to, uh, to communicate clearly. Uh, Dr. Redfern and Dr. Fauci, you know, have... have uh, have, have taken their share of lumps. You haven't seen Dr. Redfern lately because uh, they, they haven't been happy with, with what he's been saying. Uh, but it's, um, you know, this, the, the cabinet in general uh, has been profoundly disappointing uh, in terms of, of how they have responded. Uh, Homeland Security, which has certain uh, responsibilities in this area, has, has not done the job either. So it's it's awfully disappointing. Peter, when you're when you're asked to do CNN and you're a frequent commentator, um, have they been working with you in addressing kind of how transportation is impacted by COVID? They they have a little bit, and I you know and uh, uh, and I 
but, but uh, you know, Trump and the election has really sucked uh, all the oxygen out of the TV room. And, uh, you know, they've, uh, you know, I think, uh, we, you know, I, I covered the, uh, the Kobe Bryant accident. I covered a couple of others, but, but it's been, uh, it's been pretty much as, as, as you can imagine, watch tuning it on all, all politics all the time now. So. That's going to be it. That's the foreseeable future. I'm afraid so. I'm um, afraid so. Well, I'll tell you what. Um, Artie, in our final moments, let's take a quick break, and we will come back with our guest, Peter Goltz. Back after this. Artie, we are back with our guest, Peter Goltz. Peter, we talked earlier about the devastating effect this has had on the airline industry. You can lose $84 billion this year. That, to me, means lots of layoffs, and there's thousands of, uh, you know, of people whose lives are affected by it. What's the current status of the workforce, you know, working in the airline industry? Well, I mean, they, they, you know, they, they are working under a sword of Damocles being held over their heads. Uh, the Congress did pass a, uh, a support bill, but it's running out. And uh, the the first of October uh, is is the deadline. Uh, the carriers plan usually sixty to ninety days in advance. Already, over seventy five thousand pilots, flight attendants, gate agents, mechanics have gotten notices that that layoffs are possible. Uh, there is a bipartisan bill uh, uh, ready to go. Uh, if if the White House would, would come back to the table, that that that, that would keep the uh, you know the, the jobs relatively intact, and and you know if these people are not ready to go, uh, then then the economic recovery one of the cornerstones is aviation, whether it's uh, whether it's personal travel or air cargo. If if there's seventy five to a hundred thousand people laid off, it is going to stall. Any kind of uh, of uh, recovery that, that that might come in the winter or spring of next year, because these people are going to this these are experienced people, they will walk away, and many of them won't come back, and it'll be a tragedy. That's not a very good uh, you know scenario to lay out there, particularly for people who are nervous about traveling to begin with. Well, that's right. Watch the news uh, in the next days. Uh, if, if Congress uh, and the White House don't get back together again and pass a compromise stimulus bill, you're going to see uh, the layoff notices start to go out. And as I say, I've, I've counted up over 75,000 layoff, uh, potential layoff notices that, that air carriers have announced. And you'll see some air carriers that will shut down and that will not come back. Well, do we have any optimistic <laughs> note to end the show on? Yeah, what's the good, what's the golden what's, news? What's the good news? What's the good news? Silver lining. Well, if there is one. I think, I think if there, there, there is a silver lining in this, and it's a, it's a pretty dim one, is, is that this, uh, this pandemic is going to teach people how to do things differently, how to do things more efficiently, uh, how to uh, run a uh, a leaner operation, and when the when when the economy comes back, and it will, uh, it will, people will be better situated to withstand uh, another black swan event like this. Yeah, well, that's a great point. It's training for what's next. This may be a way of life for the foreseeable future. I'm afraid it might be. Peter, it's always great talking to you and catching up and hearing your insights on things. Well, we'll talk again, I'm sure. Let's see what happens happens during the coming weeks, and uh, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll we'll see if the the Congress and the White House can get together and save the industry. Gosh, I hope they can. I think you know, Arnie, you know this, but people that we work with locally who work for transportation. Uh, and the airlines and the airport and 
all the businesses that hang off of those transportation hubs, the hotels. It's, uh, it's bananas to think about how devastating this, this is, right? Ultimately. Yeah. No question. And you've got a great airport there. And it's, you know, well run. And, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we got to make sure uh, that there's an economy there to support it. Well, again, Peter, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. And we look forward to speaking to you in the future. Arnie, I will see you next week. Next week, Scott. Take care. Thank you for listening to What Do You Know? I can't wait for the next show, Scott. I'm excited too, Arnie. If you'd like to suggest a guest, send me an email at scottrichman at townsquaremedia.com. We'll see you next week. And thanks for listening to News Talk KG.